Hello class! Today we are doing nominal rigidities. So uh, until today, we have ignored money. But today we're going to talk about money. So uh, we've been talking about the business cycle. So we know that sometimes the economy is doing well. Sometimes the economy is not doing well, unemployment is high, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, it's somewhat unusual because it's, it's weird to have a cycle because it's like we know how to combine labor and capital and to get production. But sometimes it's just like, you know, the, the, there's less production. We have the same amount of labor, the same amount of capital, we get less. Or alternatively, we have the same amount of labor and capital and we get more. So, uh, you know, we want to think about what's causing that. Last time we looked at the real business cycle model. And there, they assumed that, or we assumed that there was some sort of real cause behind the fluctuations. And that real cause was changes in productivity that just couldn't be predicted. So it would be like, sometimes the economy, you know, the production functions produce more and sometimes they produce less. So, you know, that's fine and we could actually get pretty far with that model and, and uh, understand some dynamics of, of, or some, get some understanding of the way that people make decisions and firms make decisions. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's somewhat unsatisfying to just say that the reason that there's a business cycle is because sometimes people are more or less productive. I haven't said it yet this year, but um, there is actually sort of one sector where that really makes sense which is the agricultural sector. Some years the weather's better, the growing season is longer. Um, so the whole sector is more productive and some years it's less productive in a very unpredictable way. So uh, maybe that's a good model for that sort of economy. Um, however, uh, these days we think that there's something else going on. So, uh, so today we're gonna talk about a model where there's money involved and then there's gonna be costs of changing the the prices that firms have. So money is going to matter here. Um, and I guess I think it's easiest to just kind of jump right into the slides before I say anything else. So the lecture today is based on Romer chapter six, but not the whole chapter, only part of the chapter. We're only going to look at 6.5 to 6.7. So, uh, Again, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about new Keynesian economics. So what do we mean by Keynesian economics? We mean that demand is gonna be somehow driven by money. Okay, so if the government prints money, we can actually get more demand for goods, okay? So, you know, there's an old, an old uh, sort of Chicago point called Ricardian equivalence. which is sort of an anti-Keynesian point, but what this means is that if you pay people, you know, if you give people a handout today, um, they know that in the future, the government's gonna need to get that money back. So um, they're just gonna save it in the uh, expectation of future taxes. So we're not gonna have that situation. Today we're gonna be talking about a situation where printing money actually increases demand. Uh, the discussion today is also going to involve imperfect competition. This will be similar actually to what we did for the endogenous growth model. We're going to have monopoly power in this monopolistic competition sense. All right. We're going to write down a model that's going to have that sort of imperfect competition and then also menu costs. So what the menu costs mean, that means that if you want to change your price relative to what you set it at yesterday, you have to pay a cost. And then we're going to look at sort of empirical evidence about how well these nominal rigid rigidities explain uh, the actual business cycle. Okay, so what do we mean by new Keynesian economics? The number one thing is that markets are not perfect and uh, that money is not neutral. So I got my son in the background here doing, going crazy on a pillow with a wooden sword. Right, so that's really all there is to say. Um, 
when you were in Macro 101, you guys talked about the ISLM curve and, uh, and sort of reduced form looking at ways of looking at how money affects the output in the economy. So basically what the kind of the objective of the model in this class is to put some micro foundations underneath those, underneath those models. All right, imperfect competition, basic idea. Many markets in the real world are imperfectly competitive, um, which has important macroeconomic implications. So what does imperfect competition means? It means that firms have market power. Okay, so uh, if we think back to static efficiency, right? So last time we talked about in the endogenous growth model, how you want to give firms a little bit of market power so that they have the incentive to innovate. But if we just think about a one-shot model, there's no innovation there. You know, we want these uh, welfare theorems to go through, which requires perfect competition. So we don't want firms to be restricting output in order to raise prices to maximize profits. All right, so what about evidence about perfect comp imperfect or perfect competition in the real world? Well, let's suppose that we're going to focus on this industry markup ratio. Okay, so what does that mean? We're going to look at prices divided by costs. Um, and this is an okay measure of the level of market power in a society. Of course, it's not perfect because Fixed costs are also important, and you don't observe them here. C here is marginal costs. So, um, so you know, just because you have this markup doesn't necessarily mean there's imperfect competition if you consider fixed costs of beginning to produce. So what do I mean here by fixed costs? Fixed costs would be things like building a factory. You know, before you start producing cars, you have to build a factory. But then once the factory is built, the marginal cost of producing cars is C. So I look at the price of building a car divided by marginal cost. Sure, that's going to be greater than one. But um, if I consider the fact that I also had to pay these upfront fixed costs, then maybe my profits are actually, my total profits are actually zero. Um, so anyway, this is an imperfect measure of market power, but you know, we can, let's take it as a, as a first step. That's one way to look at things. The th second thing we can look at here is industry profits. And here maybe actually I drew a circle, but maybe we'd also want to take away fixed costs minus fixed costs or something like that. You could do that here. You know, you can measure what these profits look like. Okay. So um, there's a paper from 1986, an old paper now, which finds that this thing here is between 1.5 and 3, which means that firms charge about 50% to, you know, three times the, well, 50% to 200% uh, over their marginal costs. So that's like their profit margin, if you like, or at least their operating profit margin. And then in most industries, this uh, industry profits are also strictly positive. Um, so, you know, from this, at least in 1986, we conclude that the majority of industries are not perfectly competitive. And indeed, it's a little bit hard to find one that's close to perfectly competitive. Maybe the closest would be retail. So retailers typically make a very, very small profit margin, say under 10%. So this would be like 1.1 or less. Um, by the way, it so happens, this paper's from 1986. I probably should update these slides, but there was a very influential paper. I think it came out last year by um, Nick Bloom and another famous co-author. This guy's at Stanford. It was Bloom and uh, I can't remember the second co-author. Ah, it's like it's on the tip of my tongue. I think his name starts with his last name starts with A, but I can't remember who it was. But anyway, these two guys came up with a paper that was very well cited and well read, uh, widely read, which uh, basically says that if we look at these two measures, exactly these two measures actually. Um, we find that over the course of the last 20 years, both have increased a lot. So uh, markups on, on average through the whole American economy and also profits through the whole American economy have all increased quite a bit over the last 20 years, suggesting that firms are getting more and more market power. And there's been a big discussion about what could be causing that and whether these are good or bad measures. That's partly why I know some of the problems with these measures is because of this discussion around this paper. 
but it, it looks like firms are have increasing market power um, over the last 20 years. So anyway, to put a cap on that, it seems like there's a great deal of imperfect competition in at least the American economy, but also in economies all over the world. Now, what about nominal rigidities? Okay, so uh, in traditional Keynesian models, you're gonna have prices that are gonna respond slowly to nominal disturbances. You know, money, if you print money, you're gonna increase demand, you're gonna change production. Basically, these nominal rigidities are just assumed. Okay, so what are some examples? If you've ever seen an ISLM model, that would be a maybe the most typical example. If you've seen an aggregate span, aggregate supply, aggregate, <laughs> did I say supplant? Aggregate demand, aggregate supply model where you have sort of rigid nominal wages, say, something like that, where, you know, the economy changes, but you can't change the wages in the first period. You can only change them in the second period or something. That would be another example. So we're going to look at sort of a, a newer version of that literature. So this literature comes out of like the 1930s to say the 1950s. And then for a while, it sort of went out of fashion. And then in the 1980s and 90s, um, after this RBC real business cycle, uh, model became popular, people realized that money actually does matter. You can see that if the central bank makes changes about interest rates, it seems to have a real effect on the economy. And if so, then we then some of these Keynesian ideas are important. But we can't go back to this old world because um, there was a famous critique of models that didn't have micro foundations that were just based on statistical relationships called the Lucas critique. Um, so these models don't really solve that problem. So down here, we have models where we do have micro foundations and also money matters. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna have menu costs and then kind of the key point in these models, you know, menu costs can't be very big. It can't really cost firms that much to change their prices, but it can cost something, right? I mean, you know, they have to maybe call their clients or send out an invoice or literally reprint their menus, whatever it is, or, or even just pay attention, right, to changing conditions. And if you're a grocery store and you've got a thousand products, it might be hard for you to pay attention to all the different products. But anyway, the costs are probably small. And the point of the model is that even small costs can generate large business cycles. Um, so we'll see how that works. It's actually very clever. It has to do with game theory, basically. Okay, so um, real rigidities, what is that? So in the textbook, they make a big deal about this and it's actually a little bit difficult. The first time I taught this course, I don't think I totally understood real rigidities as Rover writes in the textbook. But now after teaching it several times, I think I kind of have a handle on it. So um, nominal rigidity says there's some sort of difficulty you have in, in adjusting your prices. In, our, in this model, it'll be a menu cost. You have to pay a little bit of money to adjust your prices. What the real rigidity says is that the gain that a firm gets to their profits from increasing their price or decreasing their price or adjusting their price is going to be much smaller than the aggregate change in the economy. Okay, so how might that work? So suppose, let, let's look at this example. Suppose that demand rises overall. So suppose the government prints a bunch of money. We're in this old Keynesian world where when you print money, then people demand more stuff because prices, conditional on prices not changing, right? More money's printed, prices stay the same. Okay, people want more stuff. All right, now suppose that in this world, we have monopolistic competition, but products are not substitutable. So if you change your price, you don't actually draw in more customers from other firms. Um, the most you can do is sort of, you know, change a little bit your own production. So if no other firms adjust price, then the maximum profit you'll get from adjusting your price, extra profit you'll get from adjusting your price is really small because you can't cannibalize any of that business from the other firms. You'll still get a little bit of extra profit. You are changing your own price to this sort of optimal price, but you know, your, your own production will change a little bit. But the possible gains are very small. See what I'm saying? So, um, so again, Money's printed. Given the prices don't change, demand has gone up. I would like to raise my prices, um, but the uh, the products aren't substitutable. So it means that even if I 
Oh, did I go the wrong way here? Well, product is unsuitable, which means that whatever I do is sort of independent of what's happening in the other firms. So, um, you know, I'm not going to, well, I guess in this case it would be, I'm not going to lose, lose business. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I should have said here for this example that uh, demand falls overall. Uh, Cause there I got my intuition better. Let's see here. Let me just take one second. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm actually gonna say that demand falls overall here. So I don't actually think this logic that I just used there quite goes through if demand rises. So let's say money is destroyed. Okay, so the central bank is going to uh, sell T-bills and buy cash, which means money is taken out of the economy. Um, I'll actually change this on this slide that you guys get as well. So demand falls because money is taken out of the economy. Products aren't substitutable, so I can't get uh, extra, extra um, sales by stealing from other firms. So it means that if no other firms adjust the price, then my maximum profit by from decreasing my price is, price is gonna be very small. So therefore, I, uh, I'm not gonna do it if there's, a, if there's even a small menu cost. So that's this idea, there's this interaction between nominal rigidities and real rigidities. So again, intuitively, if you only have very small menu prices or menu costs of changing prices, um, it's gonna be very hard to generate uh, business cycles at, at the uh, level that we see in the real world. But through this sort of game theory idea that while other firms are not adjusting their price, there's very little gain for me to adjust price. Through that mechanism, we can actually sort of amplify the effect of these small menu costs. And that's kind of the whole point of this model. All right, so let's actually jump into the model and see how this works. All right, so uh, we're gonna have imperfect competition. It's gonna be monopolistic competition like we saw in this endogenous growth model. We're gonna have a cost of changing prices, that's the menu cost. And we're gonna have a perfectly competitive labor market so that there's no sort of, um, firms are just gonna take the wages as given. Firms and workers are both gonna take the wages as given. Okay, so what are the results we're gonna find? A preview. It turns out that the flexible price equilibrium is socially suboptimal. You see why? Because we have imperfect competition and there's, this is just a static model. It's just one period. So of course, if you have market power, that's gonna give you a socially suboptimal amount of output. And you can probably guess it's gonna to be too little because firms are gonna restrict output in order to get a higher price so they can maximize their profit. Just like your old fashioned monopoly problem, if you remember from Micro 101 or whatever you might've seen. All right. It's not like that. Actually, I think it looks more like this. That's demand, that's average cost. This would be marginal cost. And then myself. I probably should have done this because now I actually have to think about what I'm doing here. All right, so here's Q, here's P, this is demand, okay, so that's price as a function of quantity. All right, I'm going to have a marginal cost, I suppose it's constant, all right, and then we're going to have an average cost, and that's going to look like this. Oh, I need marginal revenue, of course. Demand, marginal revenue. Okay, there we go, average cost. So we're going to uh, 
we're going to sell at the point where my, oh, it should be here actually, at the point where marginal costs equals marginal revenue. But at that point, my price is higher than my average cost. So I'm actually making a profit. I think that's it. I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm gonna wave my hands and leave it there, but maybe I should review my code 101 before I draw that, uh, that graph again. Okay, I'm gonna do it one more time because I can think through it. Oops. Quantity, price, Marginal cost, marginal revenue, All right? That's going to be marginal cost, which will be straight again too. sell at this point. So this is the equilibrium where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So you're going to make an operating profit of P minus C. All right. Now, if we let marginal revenue, uh, excuse me, marginal cost equal price, then we would be at this point. So the monopolist is restricting output in order to raise price to maximize profit, which is here. I see, okay. All right, I'm sure that made everything clear. So uh, now that we're there, we can just move on to the next slide. But anyway, the point is monopolists want to decrease the output in order to uh, maximize profit, but uh, the socially optimal amount of output would be more than, the, uh, than what monopolists produce. So in this model, we expect there to be too little production in equilibrium unless the government intervenes. Okay, so we're gonna see if the government can actually improve out outcomes by intervening, by say printing money. Okie doke. So um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Continue of households. Okay. Each firm produces a differentiated good. Goods are going to be imperfect substitutes. There's going to be elasticity of substitution measured by the parameter n. I usually like to use the parameter sigma, but that's okay. Monopolistic competition. Each household I is going to choose consumption and work hours. Okay, so there's going to be a labor choice in this model. And uh, labor is going to be perfectly competitive. Basically, people are going to uh, choose whether they want to work or not, given the, the real wage. And um, how much their labor supply it reacts to changes in the real wage is going to be governed by a parameter gamma. Okay, so here's the household. This is what their problem looks like. They are going to maximize consumption minus uh, one divided by gamma times labor to the power gamma. This is their utility function. So notice we have linear utility, okay? We're hiding something in here, right? Because when I say CI, what do I mean by consumption? Don't we have a bunch of different firms that are all, you know, they're monopolistically competitive firms? That's true, okay? So, um, so actually the CI, I'm, I'm hardly even gonna mention it, but let me just mention it here very, briefly, CI is going to equal, let's suppose that the amount of firms in the economy, which is fixed by the way here, um, suppose there's a continuum from zero to one, then it's going to be the consumption of the household I with respect to each firm. So let's call that omega. Okay, so they're going to consume a little bit from each firm. And then what was it, eta now? Eta minus one over eta, E omega. And this whole thing here, to the power eta over eta minus one. All right, so this is what's actually going on in the background here, but we're just sort of uh, waving our hands a bit and just saying that, you know, the firm want, or not really waving our hands, but we're not being so explicit about what this maximization is over. The maximization is really over consumption of each of the goods omega inside of this bundle. And then of course over L, which is the labor supply. Um, 
it would be ci omega for each of the omegas but whatever we're going to wave our hands here and we're going to and we're going to kind of skip over the stuff that's not so important for uh, the intuition of the model at least okay so anyway linear utility in consumption and uh almost linear utility in labor but with uh, this parameter gamma note the gamma is always greater than one so it means that um you're going to find a interior solution to labor supply i believe so let's think about this yeah because we're subtracting off labor right this is not leisure this is labor and as we as we increase labor since this parameter gamma is greater than one we have a convex function so let's see here if we say labor looks like that then l to the power gamma is going to look like this so it means that we're subtracting off something that's getting steeper and steeper the more labor that we have in here so um this feature is going to make it so that there's some optimal choice of labor we're never going to want to have supply an infinite amount of labor so again a modeling assumption but something that makes uh that makes sense intuitively we don't want people to want to work infinitely infinitely much okay all right so this is the utility function here's the budget constraint so uh I just realized that I forgot to make these videos short. That's okay. We'll just we'll just go with it. We'll just run with it. It's all good. We'll make we're gonna make a long video this time. All right. So anyway, uh, the price of your consumption, it has to be equal to wage times the amount of labor you supply. No problem. So then we have this other term here. What could this be? So what this is is the price times the profits. Of so it's like the not the price times the profits, but the price times the real uh, profits of the firm. So, you know, think about if the firm is making apples, it's like the number of apples that the firm makes times the price that they sell the apples at. And since um, consumption is just, uh, it's just only apples, there's only this one type of good in the economy, uh, we can sort of just use that. Okay, so this, is, this means that the households own firms, and then this is like the real profits and then this is the uh, the nominal profits, All right? So anyway, uh, let's substitute it in. We can actually rewrite ci. We can divide everything through by p, and then just substitute it in. Pi i plus w divided by p times li in for ci here, and get the new utility function, which looks like this: pi i w divided by p li from here minus one divided by gamma li to the power gamma from there all right take the derivative with respect to li that's the easy one and we get um, that the amount of labor supplied is related to the wage the real wage of course it's going to make kind of more sense to do this i don't know why i didn't write it this way but i'm writing it this way here to the power one over gamma minus one okay so what this says is Gamma, remember, is something greater than one. So the higher the wage is, conditional on the price, so it's just fixed prices. So think about the higher the wage is, um, the more people want to supply labor, the more they want to work. Right, that's the optimal labor supply. And you can see this one divided by gamma minus one, this coefficient here tells you how sensitive the labor supply is to the real wages. All right, so if we increase the wages, how much more do people want to work? And you can imagine, if gamma is very close to one, it's above one, but very close, this thing is huge, which means that if you increase wages a little bit, people really increase the labor supply a lot. Alternatively, if gamma is huge, if gamma is close to infinity, then it means that the amount people work is independent of the wage. Actually, let me stop here. I think that it's better to make little videos and this is a natural place to take a break. So let's take a break. I'll stop this video and start a new one.